Let us have a moment of silence, prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning. Amen. Congregation, would you please stand? Would you take your hymnals and open to number 690, 690? We'll be singing America the Beautiful. Please stand. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> Good morning. And I should also say, of course, happy 4th of July weekend. I thought in honor of 4th of July, I would dress the part. So I've got a blue suit, a white shirt, and a necktie that's blue background and lots of American flags on it. So I got all the colors covered. <laughs> I have to welcome those of you that are here as well as those of you that are worshiping with us this morning live through closed circuit cable television at the Elmcrest Manor and also welcome to those of you that uh, will be joining us later through your various electronic devices. I have some announcements to make. We will be having coffee hour after worship service downstairs in the fellowship hall. Uh, Board of Christian Education meeting will be next Sunday after worship service and a reminder for those of you on the church council at the last meeting we changed the date from July 4th to July 11th so council meeting will be a week from tomorrow July 11th at our regularly scheduled time 
Do we, I'm aware of one birthday. Do we have other announcements that need to be made? Anyone with an announcement? I, I can't hear you. I have to talk louder. Anastasia, okay. Sixty? Don't get me involved in these date debates. Okay, so uh, we also, uh, I understand that Haley Fuchs Stefan uh, has a birthday. So we've got several, so let's sing happy birthday, dear friends. Anita as well? The 6th, 6th of July, okay. Anyone else? Well, let's sing happy birthday, dear friends. Yeah, okay. For our pulpit humor today, there was a priest from Holland who was visiting the Catholic rectory, and one night they were having dinner together, and he explained that the red, white, and blue in the flag of the Netherlands symbolizes our taxes. We turn red when we talk about them, white when we get our tax bill, and blue after we pay them. One of the American priests responded, that's the same with us, but we see stars too. Oh, boy. Well, our praise song is in our hymnal, uh, number 693. This is my country, and so if you'd please stand, we'll sing that through a couple of times. 693, this is my country. Well, sure, I can always use help with singing. Well, you got to sing. Let's take a moment to meet and greet one another.
If you take your bulletin insert, you'll see there a listing of our praises and our prayer requests. Um, I've been in conversation with Alma Hyde both while in Connecticut and upon my return, and she called again this morning and asked me to give an update on Leonard. Leonard had two uh, brain bleeds, and uh, they had to drill through his cranium uh, in both locations to uh, get rid of the blood uh, that had dried there from the brain bleeds, and that part of the procedure went well. And a couple days after that, it looked like he was recuperating well, but now he, she's concerned because his blood pressure is all over the place, up and down, up and down. Uh, so uh, she asked for our prayers, and so if we would pray for him today, and then if you would pray for him during the week, of course, as well as these other concerns, uh, that would be a good thing. Are there other requests, updates, praises, anything of that sort before we go to the Lord in prayer this morning? Okay. If not, uh, then let us take a moment to speak to the Lord in the privacy of our hearts. That will be followed by a pastoral prayer. Then together we'll say the Lord's Prayer. Let's come to his throne of grace at this time. Heavenly Father, we know that with you there is nothing that is impossible. We think of all of the miraculous healings that took place in your word, both Old and New Testament. And so as we come and as we lift up Leonard and others who have health concerns, we do ask that you as the great physician would touch their bodies and bring them healing. Whether it's cancer whether it's other kinds of health concerns, brain bleeds, recovering from various kinds of surgeries, we ask that you would restore their health and mobility, whatever it is that's needed. We also do give you praise for the moisture that we received last night. It was needed, and we do ask that you'd continue to bless us with your rain as we need it, that we might not just enjoy the aesthetics, the flowers and the green grass, but that we might feed people across our nation and across our world as well. Father, we pray for those families whose hearts are heavy at this time because they have lost loved ones. We ask that you would lift them up on the wings of eagles, that you would comfort them as only your Holy Spirit is capable of doing. For these and for so many other things this morning, Lord, that perhaps were not put into words, we know that your Holy Spirit searches our hearts and minds, knows what those needs, burdens, and concerns are before we express them in words and even before we would think them as thoughts. And so we ask for you to minister to those concerns as well. In Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our most gracious God, we are reminded this day of freedom, and the great price that was paid for it, the freedom of living in the United States of America, that was paid for and protected by the sacrifices of many lives, and the freedom of living in Christ, which was paid for and secured himself with Jesus' own blood. No gift or offering can ever repay these precious lives for the freedoms that are now ours. So in humbleness and in gratitude, we treasure and live in freedom this day. We bring to you now, Lord, both our money and our lives to be used so that others may be free. For your kingdom and your glory, we ask you bless and multiply these gifts. For it's in your son's name that we ask it. Amen.
please rise for offertory response. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> Turn with me, if you would, in your scripture to Hebrews chapter 11. We'll be reading verses 8 through 19, and of course, this is our sermon text for today, we're going to be looking at and talking about four tests of a real believer, or another way to say that it is, what are four of the key things that people go through in life that show us where we are spiritually, I think, in our development? Because a person can uh, maybe not do well in these areas, it doesn't mean they're not a believer necessarily. So. Um, but to be aware of that, and I will point out those four things, those key words as we read this scripture passage this morning from Hebrews 11, 8 through 19. By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. That, that's the where question that we have in our walk with God. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. Heirs, that's the when question, because heirs is something that comes later. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith Abraham, even though he was past age, and, Abraham, and Sarah herself was barren, that's the how question, past age and barren was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful, him who made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the sea. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son. That's the why question. Why would God ask him to do that? Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. Here it ends the reading of God's holy word. This morning we're going to look at the four tests that believers often go through as we look at the life of Abraham. He's an example of the four ways that God tests our faith. And in some cases, I'm not necessarily suggesting that God caused the events that happen in our life, but he does use them to test our faith. So that's the intent that I mean when I say he tests our faith. And so we're going to look at the four ways that God uses these tests in our life. And if I were to ask you today, are you a real believer? I think most of us would say, yes, I'm a believer. And I'd say, how do you know? You'd say, well, I believe in God. Well, that's a good start. But in James 2.19, it says that even the devil believes in God. So there's more to getting into heaven, and that's not really our main point for today than, than just knowing that there's a God that exists. James says, faith without works is dead. That means if your actions don't correspond with what you believe, 
then your faith is worthless. So what does it mean to be a true believer, or what does it mean to have evidences of being a believer through the test that comes our way in life? Look at Hebrews 11.8. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and, eaten, and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Where? See, that, that's the, the where question. The test of a major change. The test of a major change. That's one of the tests of a believer. He didn't know the where. The where question. Now, most of you know the story of Abraham. Abraham was asked to make a major change in his life. He was asked to just suddenly pack up and leave and get moving. And I suppose that Abraham had a lot of questions as any of us would. Like he said, where am I going? That's the test of a major change. Where am I going? And the Lord said, well, I'll let you know down the road. Hmm, not very comforting, is it? Abraham, how long is it going to take? Uh, don't worry, just get going and I'll let you know down the road. Not very comforting. Well, how do I know, Lord, when I've gotten there? He says, well, I'll, I'll tell you after you get there. Would you make a move, a major change on that basis if you didn't know the where answer? I suspect it was extra difficult for Abraham. The Bible tells us that Abraham was 75 years old when God told him to move. And if I'm Abraham, and Abraham's probably thinking, well, God, move, no thanks. After all, I'm ready to retire. And God said, no, you're not. You're ready to aspire. Abraham said, I'm ready to start collecting my Social Security. And God said, no, you're not. You're ready for social insecurity. Abraham said, I'm ready to hang it up. No, he says, it's time for you to take it down and get moving. Abraham said, God, I'm ready to take it easy and relax and be on easy street. And God says, nope. You're going to have some really big adventures in your life coming up, even at your age. He was old. He was extremely wealthy, the Bible tells us. He lived in a city called Ur, Ur of the Chaldees. Now, the name maybe doesn't sound too appealing. If you were to say to somebody, where do you live? Ur. No. But Ur was a thriving metropolis with lots of wealthy people, and he had all kinds of animals and money. He was extremely wealthy. Why on earth would he want to move? when he's on easy street already. On top of that, God had not told him where he was going, but verse 8 tells us that Abraham moved immediately even though he didn't know where, the where question in life. Test number two is a delayed promise. A delayed promise. That's the when question. The when question says, by faith, Abraham made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country, and he, and he lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. Promise. So when there's a promise and there's a delay, then we ask the when question, don't we? Lord, when is this going to happen? Especially if you're absolutely certain that God has made you a promise, as they were in this case. And God promised Abraham, if you move, I'll give you the land of Israel. The problem was there was a delay in the transfer of ownership. Abraham lived a hundred more years after he moved, and he never did receive that land. And notice that it says that they lived in tents. Man, you talk about temporary living quarters. Tents? They, they didn't just go camping in a tent for Fourth of July weekend, folks, this is day in, day out, every day of their lives. They lived in a tent. How long did he have to wait for the promise to be fulfilled? Well, in a sense, two more generations, or two sons at least, Isaac and Jacob, his sons. It was not until after they both had come along that the promise is fulfilled. And as Abraham is aging those other hundred years that he lived, is he saying, when, Lord? When? When's the promise going to be filled? When am I going to get it? You see, when you really trust God, then you don't have to know the when. You don't. And some of you may be experiencing this second thing today. 
You're, you're asking some questions about the when. You're in the when test. And your question is, Lord, when? When are things going to get better in my marriage? When am I going to get married? When am I going to have a baby? When am I going to get that job? When am I going to get that promotion? When, 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 when? When am I going to get well? My health is not good. That's the when question when things are not going well in your life. So in this series, we looked at the life of Moses, we looked at Noah, and today we're looking at Abraham, and we see that believers go through periods of testing. Test one was a major change. That's the where question. Test two is a delayed promise. That's the when question. Now, test number three, an impossible problem. An impossible problem. That's the how question. The how question. How is God going to help you out with this impossible situation that you're going through? Hebrews 11.12 says, By faith Abraham, even though he was past age, and Sarah herself was barren. That word barren means she was physically incapable of bearing children because of her age. That's what it means. It didn't mean that she's just having trouble getting pregnant. It means she was physically incapable of having a child. And it says, was unable to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he was as good as dead, came his descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sands on the seashore. That was the third great test in Abraham's life. He promised that one day he would be the father of a great nation, yet he was too old to bear children, and his wife as well was barren. He was 99. He still didn't have any kids. How could God fulfill the promise? His wife was barren. 99 years old, that's, that's getting pretty old. And not only worse... But Sarah is barren, and she's in her 90s. She's already gone through menopause. She's incapable of bearing children. And Abraham looks at me and says, No way, Jose. This is not going to happen. And Sarah looks at herself, Double no way, Jose. I'm beyond childbearing years. It's an impossible situation. How is God going to make good on his promise? These two people had to be wondering. It was an impossible situation. So in, in Genesis chapter 18, you don't need to turn there, but God sends a couple of messengers and said, yes, God is going to keep his promise uh, to you. And um, he explains that they're going to have a son uh, as promised and so on to to make sure that God's promise is fulfilled, and they, they laugh. They, <laughs> Are you kidding me? This is, cannot happen. And Sarah laughs to herself, and they said, well, we'll come back later on in the spring and let you know when this thing's going to happen. And then they come back, and they said, well, Sarah, why did you laugh? And Sarah said, well, I didn't laugh. See, she lied, because she was embarrassed, I guess. But anyway... Now, now, obviously, Sarah did not believe that she was going to have a baby, not only because she laughed, but think of this. If you were in your 90s and you were told that you were going to have a baby, you wouldn't laugh, you'd cry. But she says, no, no, I didn't laugh. They said, yes, you did. And then the firstborn son is born, and you know what they named him? Abraham names him Isaac. Isaac in Hebrew means to laugh. That's what translated the word means. So God got the last laugh. Maybe right now some of you are worried about how God's going to do something in your own life, in the life of your family, the life of your community. You say, well, huh, how is that going to happen? Doesn't seem possible. The how questions of life. You see, if we have great faith, we will expect a miracle without knowing the how question. So the test of life, review a major change, that's the where. A delayed promise, that's the when. An impossible situation, that's the how. One last test, the fourth one. 
a senseless tragedy. A senseless tragedy, that's the why question. It's the ultimate test, I suppose. And we say, well, I don't understand why such and such a things are happening, or I don't understand why there's so much evil and suffering in the world, or some people might word it a little differently, and they may say, well, why is it that bad things happen to good people? There's a lot of different ways to think about that particular issue. Part of that answer, and let me emphasize, only a small part of it is that God gives us free will. Gives us free will. People, we and other people make choices, and the choices that we make and the choices that other people make affect our lives and affect other people's lives as well. God gives us the freedom of choice. I, I can only think of one situation, off, at least off the top of my head, where God violated someone's free will, and that's with Pharaoh in Egypt. So if you read the, the miracles that he did, it says, and Pharaoh hardened his heart, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. over, And then at one point it says, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And I personally believe that at that point, God said, that's it for you. No more, ch no more chances for repentance. I'm going to harden your heart, and now my will is going to be fulfilled. We'll have the final miracle, the death of the firstborn, and then you will set my people free. No more monkeying around with you, Pharaoh. That's it. In my thinking, Pharaoh no longer had free will, at least at that particular moment in time. So what is happening in the life of Abraham, a potentially senseless tragedy that raises the why question? God says, pack up some belongings, take your son Isaac, go to such and such a place, such a region, and sacrifice your son. And Abraham's thinking, huh, well, this isn't the God that I know. This isn't the God that I understand. This is the God that has condemned the sacrifice of their children to God's. This doesn't make any sense. Why? Why would God ask me to do that? And why would God ask me to do that when I have been faithful to him? And why would God ask me to do that to my son, who's supposed to be the one that brings about the promise that God promised to bring? Why? None of it made any sense. But verse 19, it says he reasoned, or in other words, he calculated and thought it through that even God could raise his son from the dead if that's what it took. Now, remember, Abraham had no idea ahead of time whether God would make him go through with the sacrifice of his son or not. He didn't know. And the Bible tells us as he was about to slay him, God interceded and said, there's a ram right over there caught in the thicket of those bushes. You take that and you sacrifice that, not your son. See, God is not a barbarian. Wow. What a test, huh? The test of why. Now, there's nothing wrong with asking those why questions. When things are difficult for us, when we have tragedies, it's natural to ask the why questions. Natural. People in Scripture have done that. Abraham did it, as did so many others. But the question is, how do you handle the whys, the whens, the wheres, and the hows in life when God seems to be silent? How do you handle those tests, if we can call them that? You see, faith goes beyond the realm of explanation. Let me say that again. Faith goes beyond the realm of explanation. God doesn't give us explanations ahead of time necessarily. He doesn't give us explanations necessarily at the moment. And sometimes he may or may not give an explanation in the future. It's not ultimately about explanations. It's about will we follow God when it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. What tests are you facing now? Do you have a major change going on in your life? That's the where question. Maybe you're going through the when question. You're wondering when God is going to answer or intercede in some way that you've been praying about. There's a delayed promise, perhaps. That's the when question. Maybe you're in the how. 
You're facing some situation that seems to be absolutely impossible. You say, well, how can this be resolved? What is the Lord going to do? You know, how? It just doesn't make any sense. And then the Lord says, just trust me and I'll show you. Maybe some of you are in the fourth test. There's been a, a tragedy or a difficulty of, of some sort and you're asking why. Can you trust God even when you don't know the answer to the why question? I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes and bow your heads and be in a, in a spirit of prayer. And, and just do a little sort of mental inventory with yourself. Not out loud, just, just within yourself. And ask yourself, well, how are you doing in these four areas? Are you willing to wait on God's timing when you don't know the when? Are you willing to expect a miracle when you don't know how it's going to happen? Are you going to trust God's promise when you don't know the answer to the why question? How did you do on the mental test? If you felt like you didn't do as well as you would have liked to, that's okay. God's the God of second, third, fourth, tenth, twentieth, fiftieth, however many opportunities, chances we may need. And he's not really asking a whole lot of us in order for him to get our questions answered. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 24, there's a man who come to Jesus who had a son. The son was possessed with an evil spirit. And Jesus asked this man, well, do you want your son to be healed? And the man said, well, yes. And Jesus said, do you believe? And the man gives a classic answer. He said, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. So there, there was at least a kernel of belief that was there, but yet there was some doubt, there was some unbelief. And Jesus said, that's okay, I get it. You're struggling with both of those things, but that's enough. You just asked me to help with your unbelief, and you know what he did? He healed his son. So if we have doubts, we have some unbelief, that's okay. Just say, God, help me with my unbelief, and then expect to God to act in your behalf. Assuming it's within his will, of course, of course. So, the when, the where, the why, and the how, those are the tests. Amen. Congregation, if you would please stand if you take your hymnals and open to number 79, we'll be singing Trusting Jesus. Please stand.
as we bow our heads for the benediction, I remind you that we have coffee hour downstairs in the fellowship hall after the service. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks that you do give us free will, that we have choices that we make in life, as do other people around us. We ask you to help us to make the good choices, and we ask, too, that you would help us to trust you when things don't seem to be going the way we think that they should. In trusting Jesus, that is all. Amen.